There's no other way to slice it. There's no other way to slice it. A choke job is a choke job. That is something we will talk about on today's show. Plus, I got some boxing stuff to get into. Plus, conservative pundit commentator Candace Owens had a lot to say about the qualifications of black folks or lack thereof, along with other folks as well, in fairness to her. Well, I got somebody that wants to respond to her. And it ain't just me. How about Roland Martin? Oh, yeah. It's going to be a hot show today. Stephen A. Smith show in the house. Let's roll. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at the very least three times per week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. I'm finally back right here in my beautiful studio. By the way, appreciate all the love and support from all of my subscribers out there. We've now climbed and exceeded over 531,000 subscribers in just 10 months, picking up over 80,000 in the last three weeks. Can't thank y'all enough. Appreciate the love. Keep it coming, and you know I'll keep on coming. By the way, Click the bell to get notified for all of our new content, and bam, there you'll have it. Also, don't forget to grab a copy of my New York Times best-selling memoir, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes, which is now available in paperback. So just head straight to straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy. Speaking of that, I want to thank all of you for making my book, again, the New York Times bestseller. And recently, I just got nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Doesn't happen without your support. So I really, really appreciate it, and I thank you for it from the bottom of my heart. I really do. Let me get to some football items, because we had a championship weekend, is what you call it, when the AFC and the NFC is going up against each other for a berth to the Super Bowl. And I'm going to start off with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens. Patrick Mahomes, we already know, is a two-time Super Bowl champion. We know in six years as a start, he's going to six AFC title games and three Super Bowls. He's won two. We know that the one Super Bowl that he lost was to Tom Brady. The one AFC championship game, the other AFC championship game he lost was when Tom Brady was a member of the New England Patriots. Only two quarterbacks have beaten this man in his postseason career. One's name is Tom Brady who beat him twice. The other is Joe Burrow of the Cincinnati Bengals, but I digress. This man shows up this past weekend in Baltimore, Maryland against the top-seeded Baltimore Ravens, won 13 games this season, won a playoff game in Lamar Jackson's first AFC championship game. They've got the number one defense in the National Football League. They've got an offense that finally got some receivers to throw to in Zay Flowers, Nelson Aguilar, even to a lesser degree, Odell Beckham Jr. Mark Andrews came back off, off, off the injured list. He was ready to go. Gus Edwards is running in your backfield. John Harbaugh is your coach. And you've got a defense filled with rough riders. You were supposed to win this game. They lost 17 to 10. And that 10 matters because when you were averaging damn near 30 points a game during a regular season, and you certainly put up those numbers in your divisional playoff game against the Houston Texans and a rookie quarterback in C.J. Stroud, but all of a sudden you go up against arguably the GOAT in a lot of people's eyes in Patrick Mahomes, and you wet the bed, that's a collective collapse, no doubt about it. You got offensive coordinator Todd Monken. He didn't show up. How do you not run the football when you've been running the football effectively all year long? How do you forget to do that? How do you have Lamar Jackson literally living in the pocket, trying to look like a pocket pastor? That's problematic. If you're John Harbaugh, how do you allow your team to be so undisciplined, unnecessary roughness penalties, rough in the passer penalties, taunting penalties, all of this other stuff went down. It was a collective collapse by the Baltimore Ravens. There is no way around it, but it still comes down to Lamar Jackson. You can slice it any way you want to. You see it right there, in action, Jackson. That's what it says. And there's a reason it says that. The regular season, 67%. Sunday, 54%. 229 yards passing, even though you did 272 on Sunday. But we understood. We understood and we saw the overthrows, the underthrows, the side throws that were blocked at the line of scrimmage, passing the ball when there was gaps for you to run the football, et cetera, et cetera. I tell y'all this all the time, okay? When it gets tight, when clutch time arrives, palms get sweaty, backsides get tight. I say it to you all the time. This ain't Stephen A throwing out the first damn pitch. I don't play baseball. I showed up that particular day, I sucked. Very, very simple. It's not complicated. 
But I'll be damned if this is something that I'm doing all the time and I do on a regular basis with a strong degree of regularity, of course, and then all of a sudden I show up in a moment and I forget how to do what I've normally been doing, especially as the competition stiffens. It was something to be said about Patrick Mahomes on that other side of the field, wasn't it? That dude, Patrick Mahomes, on the other side of the field, knowing that any mistake I made is something that he could capitalize off of, that's when you find out what you're made of. And at the end of the day, Lamar Jackson came up small. He will be the league MVP in all likelihood. It will be his second league MVP. He won one in 2019. He's going to win one this year. Do you know that nine quarterbacks in National Football League history have won two, at least two, league MVPs? Do you know that every single one of them ended up being a Super Bowl champion? Every one of them. From Bart Starr to Joe Montana to Peyton Manning and Tom Brady themselves and Patrick Mahomes. Do you know that every single one of them have won a Super Bowl championship? Lamar Jackson hasn't been to one. It's six years. Now, he hasn't been in the league 10 years or a decade, but he ain't a rookie either. And when you look at the AFC, and when you look at the C.J. Stroud, and when you look at the Josh Allen, when you look at the fact that Patrick Mahomes ain't going anywhere, and neither is Andy Reid coaching him, when you look at the fact that Jim Harbaugh has arrived in Los Angeles to save the day for Justin Herbert, when you look at the fact that Joe Burrow will be back because the Cincinnati Bengals are not the same team without him than they are with him, when you imagine what Cleveland might be capable of if Deshaun Watson ever shows back up and reminds the world of what he's capable of doing because Cleveland's defense was all world throughout this regular season, and we know that Nick Chubb will be back after him being injured last year and they still got Kareem Hunt and they still got David Njoku and they still got Amari Cooper. If Deshaun Watson shows up in Cleveland and do what he's supposed to do, if Tua Tungvaloa continues to ascend and Tyreek Hill ain't going anywhere and neither is Jalen Waddle, excuse me, there's no guarantee that Lamar Jackson is going to be back in this picture, in this mix. A missed opportunity. And yes, it was a collective collapse on the part of the offensive side of the ball because the defense showed up, albeit they didn't do so in the first two offensive possessions of the game. But in the end, what it comes down to is that your offense had an opportunity and you blew it. You blew it. Palms got sweaty. Asses got tight. And as a result, they folded. There's no way around it. That is what happened. As great as Patrick Mahomes is, as great as Travis Kelsey is, 11 targets, 11 receptions, 116 yards, and a TD. As great as they are when Taylor Swift is in the house, because we can't forget her. In the end, what you saw was a champion that showed up and acted like champions. And you saw wannabes validating why they're wannabes. It's that simple. One could easily say the same about the Detroit Lions but you would not have been paying attention. They were running the football effectively with Montgomery and Gibbs coming out of the backfield. They were running roughshod over the San Francisco 49ers. Not only were the San Francisco 49ers getting beat, they were getting punked. They looked soft. They looked like they were being run over. They looked like they were being mauled by a much more physical Detroit Lions team. But then Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant himself, showed why that label no longer applies to him. The brother's something special, y'all. 267 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception, 48 yards rushing, three for three for 52 yards rushing, three or four passing for about 42 yards passing in pressurized, scrambling situations. Every one of those plays was for a first down. That's what clutch is when you're down 24-7. That's what clutch is when you're on your home turf and you got the governor of California in the house with the commissioner and everybody else and everybody and their grandmama is watching you and you down 24-7 to and get ready to get blown out of your own stadium about an hour and 15 minutes away from San Francisco, even though you call yourself the San Francisco 49ers, but you're in Santa Clara. Different subject for another day. My point is there was every reason to sit back and feel such an immense level of pressure that you panic and fold. That's not what happened. Instead, Brock Purdy rose to the occasion. Brandon Ayuk rose to the occasion. Debo Samuel rose to the occasion. And my God, Christian McCaffrey rose to the occasion. He's something special. And in case y'all haven't remembered what I've said in the past, when I brought up the name Christian McCaffrey, I called it reverse discrimination. 
because I said if he were a black quarterback, a black running back, I'm sorry, we would have been talking about him in a much more pristine fashion years ago. He comes out of Stanford rushing for over 2,000 yards. And we were still acting like there was cats better than him until he rolled up in the NFL and he was balling out for the Carolina Panthers. But now he's in the system and with a coach in Kyle Shanahan who really, really knows what he's doing. And as a result, San Francisco has ascended. And they come back from a 24 to 7 deficit. And they go on a 27 to nothing spree. Go up 34 24 before Detroit scores that touchdown in the waning moments and tried an onside kick that ultimately failed. In the end, props to the Detroit Lions. Dan Campbell shouldn't have went for it for a fourth and two. Okay? But he didn't ask Reynolds to drop the damn ball. Okay? He went for a fourth down and golf hit Reynolds again. He drops the pass. Would have been an easy first down. You got to kick that field goal. You got to take those three points. All of these things are true. But in the end, when you look at Detroit's talent, you got to give them props where props is due. Remember, coming into the NFC Championship game, they had one playoff victory. Before these playoffs began, they had one playoff victory since 1957. And that came in 1991. It was over 30 years since these dudes won a playoff game. And this team went to the NFC Championship game and came within 30 minutes of a Super Bowl berth. They blew it, no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean that that team doesn't have tremendous promise and they won't be back. That's my take on what transpired on Championship Weekend this past Sunday. Let me bring in somebody who's more than qualified to talk about that. It's my partner in crime, contributes to the show Get Up in the Mornings, contributes to First Take on ESPN, contributor and on Monday Night Football, okay, NFL Live, Swagoo himself, the one and only Marcus Smith. What's up, big boy? How you doing, man? What's up, my brother? I appreciate you having me, man. Oh, man, please. Thank you so much. Talk to me about what you saw Sunday when you watched the Baltimore Ravens lose in the fashion that they lost to the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and those boys. What were your thoughts? One, I saw organizational failure. As failure as a, secondly, I'm going where you were going, to Lamar Jackson, because we expected, first of all, I think I swayed you to believe that this was the time for the Baltimore Ravens. Yes, you did. And especially Lamar Jackson. And the reason being is because I saw, one, the Baltimore Ravens were a better team than Kansas City all season long. Lamar obviously playing at an MVP level. The success that they were having, I literally said that they have to beat themselves in order to lose a football game. Now, you can make an argument that they did. You can make you, you can look back at that game and see a lot of things that would tell you the Baltimore Ravens are more of the cause of their disaster that they had against the Kansas City Chiefs than the actual Kansas City Chiefs team. Uh, for as great as Patrick Mahomes is, and we saw him manage the game in the second half and not get too wild, it was only 17 points for a long time in that football game. And credit Steve Spagnola and credit the Kansas City Chiefs defense, but this was about Lamar Jackson. This was about Todd Munkin, but more so I'm focusing on the quarterback because we expect you to make plays to even it up. We expect you to make plays to take a lead. We expect you to use your legs to dominate and create opportunities for your offense. He looked rattled. He looked nervous. He looked unsure of himself. And he looked putrid compared to what we had seen all season long. But especially against good teams. Do you not remember? That's the same team that dominated the San Francisco 49ers. That's the same team that tore the Detroit Lions apart. This Baltimore Ravens team is what we're talking about. And for them to get to an AFC championship at home against Patrick Mahomes, everything in my mind told me that the Lamar Jackson that I've been seeing the mentality that Lamar Jackson has, he should have been more than ready for that moment so, to be a superstar walking away from that So game. is the word choke a bit excessive or is it apropos in this situation based on everything you just articulated? Well, you know, choke to me is different, Stephen A., because, listen, you had opportunities. Obviously, 
he hit the deep ball to Zay Flowers, and we talked about the misses. Zay Flowers waited about yeah. a, a year and a day for that ball to fall into his arms. He was wide open, and a dance, I it had more air under the ball. I mean, damn. <laughs> I mean, come on now. I, I don't know how much credit I could give Lamar Jackson for that throw. He stood there waiting, called this girl, ordered room service and everything else in between before the ball landed in his arms. Okay, I'll give you that. So we can attribute choke. You've swayed me. But I'm I'm going to say choke more so because Lamar Jackson tried to beat Patrick Mahomes instead of beating the Kansas City Chiefs. And Lamar Jackson forgot that he was the most dynamic playmaker on the field. And he wanted to stand in the pocket. And that's why you can't acknowledge this without talking about Todd Monk and setting him up right. for success. But ultimately, Stephen A., you know it. You, you We love basketball. You know how much I love it. Man, when it's time to take over the game, I don't give a damn what the call is. I don't care what your coach is saying. Be the Lamar Jackson that we all expected you to be. Go rush for 120 yards if the pass is not there. Take off out of the pocket like Patrick Mahomes did a couple times to go pick up a first down. I was infuriated, bro. I was so frustrated with his lack of, 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 of energy towards – Going get a win mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know how people say, well, I'm going to let the game come to me. Right. It felt like Lamar Jackson was doing that all game. And that's what pissed me off more than anything. I'm going to throw this at you. There's an upside to all of this. As much as depressed as we all are, that we didn't see Lamar Jackson because we wanted that brother in that Super Bowl. We wanted to see him on that stage. We would have still been wondering, what's he going to bring? In the case of Patrick Mahomes, we're not wondering about a damn thing. We know what he's going to do. I mean, it, 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 we're at that point right now where it is just clear what Patrick Mahomes is going to do on the field. It's just a matter of whether or not Rice or Valdez Scantlin or, 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 or somebody else is going to drop passes or catch passes. That's what we're looking at because what I saw from that San Francisco defense, at least in that first half, against Detroit, if I'm Andy Reid, if, if, I'm, if I'm him, Pacheco's getting that ball in the first yes, half. Sir. I want to see him run that football against San Francisco because I think it could happen. What do you make of what you've seen from, San, from Kansas City? I love what Kansas City has done. And Stephen A., to your point, they leaned into Isaiah Pacheco a lot. So I don't expect them to get away from it. Their formula is working from an offensive standpoint. Here's the other thing. As much as we talk about them not being able to stop the run, Jared Goff was having his way yes. in the passing game in the first half as well. Now, that's a product of the success that they were having on the ground. But if you having success on the ground and Patrick Mahomes, your quarterback, you ain't coming back from 24 to 7. Mm. You, you could cancel that. The, the Super Bowl will be over at halftime if, it, if, it, if the first half goes like it went against the Detroit Lions. And I'm sure San Francisco going to make adjustments. I'm sure they're going to try to, you know, obviously get that run game fixed. But remember, too, Kansas City going into this game with the best, better defense than mm. they had when they played them the first time. Mm. And a better defense than, than since Patrick Mahomes has been there. Even though they've had a better success. Offense. Not a better and, offense, and though. Hurts. Not a better offense, though. No, not a better. Yeah. But, but, Stephen A., didn't we, ain't that the reason we thought Baltimore would win? Yeah. That, I mean, that's I, the reason. I'm just thinking about it this way, Swagoo. I'm glad, I'm thankful that Tyreek Hill ain't in Kansas City because it wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair. I mean, it, it just wouldn't be fair. It, it, I, I like competition, and there would be no competition if Patrick Mahomes had Tyreek Hill to throw the football to along with Kelsey, along with Pacheco right, running the football with the defense that they now have in, in, in Kansas City right now as a number two ranked defense. But I say this to you, Purdy, Purdy, what did you see from Purdy to make you think he would be better suited to go up against Lamar Jackson. I'm sorry, to go up against Patrick Mahomes than Mar Lamar Jackson was. Talk to me about that. The athleticism, the improv, the sense of urgency that he had, not only this past game, but in the fourth quarter against the Green Bay Packers when he had a lot of success and had to make Answered a game winning drive. The second half, when he obviously came back and did what he needed to do against Detroit, he was as responsible for San Francisco resurgence in the second half as anybody. And that's what we have been waiting on. Stephen A., it was fair to talk about Brock Purdy and whether this was a product of Kyle Shanahan and why they're having so much success. That's fair. 
like the biggest detriment, and I've said it before to Brock Purdy and his attention, was the fact that he was in San Francisco, a team we had already seen go to NFC championships mm-hmm. and a Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo. So in order to get the credit that Brock Purdy deserves and probably deserved before people start giving him credit, he had to do something like this. Mm-hmm. He had to have a moment where, where everything was against him and nothing was going right, and he was the catalyst. He was okay. the catalyst. Well, he was the reason in the second half of that football Well, let me game. say this to you, last question, because the list is fluid. The list is fluid. So I want you to know <laughs> that, okay? Uh, with that being said, I'm assuming you have the right to change your mind because we got a couple of weeks. You're going with Kansas City over San Francisco in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm not picking against Patrick Mahomes again, bro. I'm, mm. I'm, you know, we we had our one time where me and you tried to go to Vegas and make right. as much money as possible betting yeah. on the Baltimore Ravens. Right. Everything was lined up, and 15 walked into M&T Bank Stadium like he was throwing, in, like he was playing football with his kids in the backyard, and it didn't matter who was standing across from him. Mm. And we've seen it happen enough now to know that if he loses, it's usually beca- because of a phenomenal performance from somebody else on the other team. I'm not willing to bet that. I'm going to bet for 15 every time. I don't give a damn what's going right. on. Right. Um, you my boy. I love you. You know that. You know, there's nothing yeah. but love for you, man. I appreciate you. <laughs> I just feel obligated to give you this little nugget of information that you may not have had. Do you know that in his second season, Brock Purdy already has as many playoff victories as Lamar Jackson and Dak Prescott combined. <laughs> He's doubled both of them up. Both of them have two playoff victories. He has four in two years. Lamar Jackson has been in the league six years. Dak yep. Prescott has been in the league going on nine. Did you know that? Well, Stephen, you know it breaks my heart to acknowledge that. Right. Because, one, you right. know I'm a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, right. Right. and it bothers me a right. lot that right. you write right. Right. every right. single year. Right. But you also know we have a lot of conversations about this. Mm-hmm. What pisses me off the most about this mm-hmm. is the fact that I can't have an argument for any other quarterback in the NFC mm-hmm. outside of Matthew Stafford Right. Um, when it comes to clutch right. in the playoffs. Yeah. There's no other guy. So, mm-hmm. and, and now you put Lamar in context, mm-hmm. and it's like, bro, you, this was the best path. Right. Now, I don't know if it's going to happen next year or the rest of his career. Right. This was the best path for no both question. of them. For both of them. For him and, and, they, and Dak and Prescott. Trump. But, but let, let's hold on. Let's end this, 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 this you know, your, your, your visit to Stephen a., the Stephen A. Smith show by take, peeling that one sentence out that you said, it breaks your heart because Stephen A.'s right every time. You did say that. I did say that, say that. Yeah, but but yeah, but but yeah. people know that when they come yeah. to the Cowboys, yeah. you you yeah. you guess right, and you say it. I'm not guessing. I haven't guessing. I mean, I'm pro- I'm, I'm prophetic. <laughs> Appreciate you, big boy. Appreciate you, big boy. Right, Love brother. you, man. <laughs> <laughs> the one and only Marcus Smith, aka Swaggoo, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. When I return, I speak to journalist and commentator Roland Martin and give some insight on recent comments made by the one and only Candace Owens and what she had to say about DEI. Stick around. You're listening live and watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Everyone knows I'm a sports fanatic and I need to be in the middle of all the action. And how do I do that? I use Prize Picks, the largest fantasy sports platform in all of the land and available in more than 30 states, including California, Texas, and Florida. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the NFL, the NBA, or better yet, from both, and then choose more or less on their in-game stats. And if you know everything about sports, like I do, and pick correctly, you will have a chance to win up to 25 times your money. And get this, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. That's right, go to prizepicks.com and use code SAS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. The next subject is something that is highly sensitive uh, without question, particularly in the black community, because when you hear people talk about the qualifications of black folks, obviously that is something that will raise an eyebrow or a red flag, per se, in the eyes of a lot of people, especially myself, and absolutely positively without question, my next guest. Recently, uh, Mr. Charlie Kirk, uh, conservative, you know, founder of the conservative group Turning Point USA, 
made some comments about the qualifications of black folks, uh, particularly when it comes to pilots uh, in the, flying in the airwaves along with other things. And obviously Candace Owens, noted conservative uh, analyst and critic, uh, dare I say even that, uh, she definitely had her stuff to say as well. My next guest is somebody that I was interested in talking to about this. He's an award-winning journalist, columnist, and commentator. Also the host of the daily YouTube show, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Obviously that focuses on news, politics, culture, entertainment, social justice, and more. With more than 1.2 million subscribers, he's been called the voice of black America. And I can tell you, he's one of the preeminent voices in the black community, make no mistake about it. My buddy, the one and only Roland S. Martin on the show with me right now. What's going on, Roland? How are you, man? How's everything? Oh. All good. Glad to be here. Man, good to have you here. Before I even step further, I'm sure you heard about what Charlie Kirk had to say. You heard a nugget of what Candace Owens had to say. But let me play for you what the one and only Candace Owens had to say, piggybacking off of Charlie Kirk's assertions. Listen up. But unfortunately, that is the reality of what happens when it comes to DEI. And what he is remarking on is true. I would be terrified if I got onto a plane and I saw a woman flying the plane. And I know that we have the United CEO saying that he just wants to fulfill a quota. He just wants there to be more women and wants there to be more black people. And he's not concerned at first with qualifications. That is something that should alarm all of us guys, honestly. Roland, before I even ask you the question, let me piggyback off of that to make sure that I'm giving proper context to her comments because after Charlie Kirk said this, I'm sorry, if I see a black pilot, I'm gonna be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. She follows up by saying, I said the exact same thing on this show just a couple of weeks ago. I remarked that now, when I even am watching a commercial, if I see a commercial and I see a black person, a Hispanic person, an Asian person, my thought process is, did they just get this because of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, for those that don't understand what those letters mean, I no longer think the person is qualified. She said, it makes me upset that that's my thought process when I see a commercial and when I see a movie. Is this person actually even a good actor or are they just checking a box? But unfortunately, that is the reality of what happens when it comes to DEI and what is remar remarking on is true. Your thoughts, Roland Martin. Give it to me. First and foremost, uh, these people have no idea, no real understanding of what DEI is. But understand what the goal is. Uh, what you have is, and this is not recent, what it is is, is to sully any African American or person of color uh, or even white women uh, who are uh, coming into these positions. We have been a nation, the nation was built for white men, white male landowners. Uh, and so there's been this constant fight uh, for equality, for freedom. What did MLK say uh, in his speech uh, April 3rd, 1968 at Mason Temple, the night before he was killed? Be true to what you put on paper. Uh, and so what you have now is you have folks who are scared to death of how America is changing. By 2043, America is going to be a minority of whites, majority of minority, majority of people of color. And so folks are freaking out. They're freaking out because this is about power. It's about money. And so what you've always had is we go back to uh, the Black Freedom Movement, 1955 to 1968, King's assassination, affirmative action. When Nixon comes into the White House, Arthur Fletcher, they put that in place. Remember, LBJ gave a speech on that at Howard University uh, before King was killed. And so it was, oh, affirmative action. Well, we also know the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action has been white women. So they've always, go, oh, qualified, qualified. So they never used the, the qualifier qualified when speaking to somebody white. They assume they're qualified. But when it's anybody black or Latino or Asian, Native American or, or woman, uh-oh, uh, 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 are they qualified? Are they qualified? Now, you and I have been in the media business, and you and I know some white folks who have been hired, and we're sitting here like, yeah, yeah. How the hell they got the job? How did they, how All did the time? they get the job? And see, they never, see, they don't speak on that, but they want to cast doubt. So when we were in college, oh, you must have got in because of affirmative action. Oh, I'm sorry, a whole bunch of y'all got into school because your mama was white and your daddy was white and we weren't allowed to even go to these schools. But see, that's not how they want to view it. So what you now have is a well-funded, well-orchestrated attack on all of this. 
Christopher Rufo, a conservative who was who led the fight against critical race theory. This is literally what he tweeted, Stephen. Okay. This is what he said. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Now, that was his initial tweet. He later said that we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. So they went from critical race theory, remember that was in 2021, right. to drive the 2022 midterms. Now it's, oh, now it's DEI. But it's all under the same banner because they want to brand anything that has been helpful for African Americans and others to succeed in this society mm -hmm. as, oh, race based, not qualified, DEI, well, CRT, because it's all designed to scare white people because they are moving towards become a minority in this country. And obviously, you know, the, the, the numbers prove it from the standpoint that once upon a time, the white population in America was in the high 80s, obviously is dipped, and now it's at approximately at 60% and lowering. We're seeing more minorities, more Hispanics coming into the vote, uh, into the country, obviously, and obviously that there's, there's a vote, there's votes to take into consideration and yep. who's going to manipulate the vote. I get what you're saying loud and clear, and obviously that just buffers your point, but let me play devil's advocate for, for Candace Owens in this regard. Looking at these statistics, commercial aviation pilot stats. That's what I'm reading from Roland Martin. 3.4% of U.S. airline pilots are black. 2.2% are of Asian descent. 0.5% are Hispanic or Latino. And women make up just 4.6%. So considering right. considering the scarcity of those, the scarcity <laughs> of those numbers, right, combined with Candace Owens articulating that the, the, the head of United Airlines talked about making sure that diversity is a critical element of our right. hiring process. Does she not have a point in any no. way? No. Okay. There's no point. Why not? Because, again, what their goal is, their goal is say, oh, see this diversity thing? Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's awful. Well, let's roll this thing back. What, if you took all those numbers together, about 80-plus percent of all pilots in America are white. Yeah. We are white. Are white. They're white men. Right. So you're sitting there going, wait a minute. So, so, because here's the whole deal. So now all of a sudden, oh, we get a few women, a few black people, a few Latino people, a few Asian, a few Native Americans go, see, see, they're not qualified. Uh, I don't want to fly with them. I want to fly with them. But they don't question, see, this is the key. They don't question the qualifications of white men. They automatically assume, mm -hmm. oh, they must be qualified. And so it's utter nonsense. What you really have, and you and I know this because of media, you have individuals who are now saying, hey, we can't keep going to the old talent pool to find folk. We got to go to uh, new places. And what's interesting is this here. Who has been the most ardent supporter? of diversity, equity, inclusion, the United States military. When the Supreme Court had, was dealing with the affirmative action case, the military wrote a number of, uh, of, of briefs stating that it is in the national security interest of America. And guess what happened? The Supreme Court ruled that the academies, the military academies, can continue the affirmative action but not other public colleges and universities. So America, what you're saying is you want black bodies. You want Hispanic bodies, but, uh, uh, Asian American bodies, Native American bodies. You want people of color, you, you want our bodies for war, but you want to question it for corporate America, for media and education and all of this. But here's something also that's critical, Stephen. Okay. And this is what's, fre what's freaking the white folks out. And I'm being very, these, especially these conservative folks. The Black Lives Matter movement, in the wake of the George Floyd death, we had massive protests across the world. That was the first time in American history that a black movement, and I'm saying that because there were many others involved, okay. that a black movement, a majority of Americans supported it. You know what you had, Stephen? You had white 
young white folks and Latinos, others who were demanding action and demanding change. That's what's scaring them. And so now it's, oh, no, 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 we, we, we got we to gotta, we gotta change this thing because we can't mm-hmm. have these non-minority folks okay. all of a sudden standing up for this. So we now got to shift the conversation. And that's exactly what America is all, well, has always has done. Well, the, always. The Black, Eagle, the Black Eagle Joe Madison says it best. He talked about cultural conditioning. And the reason why I bring those two words up is because I'm thinking about somebody like a Candace Owens, a black woman, saying what she said, understanding that he, she herself is an accomplished individual. And because she's accomplished, are people to assume, if you took her words, people right. would use that as a license to dilute her accomplishments, to dilute her qualifications. And yet, that seems to be something that really was not embraced by her. Roland Martin, how do you that? explain it? How do you explain that? It's called a grift game, brother. It's a grift game. We know the grift game. You have always had uh, uh, certain black folks who are like, yo, I can get paid by these folks by, by, by hating on black people. With my, Stephen, I've had people over the years come to me and say, Roland, come to our side. And I'm going, hell no. Right. Because my side is humanity. It's a grift game. And so Candace is sitting here. The easiest people to get money from, and I'm just being frank, the easiest people are white conservatives. You know why? Because they love hearing a black person like Candace. So, man, they'll sit here and like, yo, we'll roll the money out. But see, Candace is not smart. First of all, the girl dropped out of college. Here's why she's not smart. I ain't going to say she ain't smart, though. No, 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 no. No, here's here's, here's why why I'm going to say she's not smart. She's smart because she knows the grift game, but she's, and the reason I'm saying she's not, not smart, black conservatives who know her, who pull her aside and has to- have told her, you need to get better educated on the issues. And so she knows who they are, but here's what, why she's not smart. When she's attacking women, saying, oh, I see a woman pilot, uh, I'm not gonna fly. So you see a woman engineer, are you not gonna walk into a building? Mm. If you see a woman architect, are you not gonna question that facility? If you see a woman in head of security, are you gonna question the security? What Candace also clearly doesn't understand, and many of these other different people, is that the reason we have today women who are now who've been ascending is because of type uh, because of ti- uh, Title IX. The problem is most people think Title IX was about sports. Mm. It wasn't. It was to open the professional schools to women who were getting federal dollars. Now remember. Now you then ask, well, where did Title IX come from? It's a provision of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Follow me here. I'm going somewhere. I'm following you. I'm following you. Black people fought to get the 1964 Civil Rights Act. If you were disabled and you love the 1996 with American with Disabilities Act, you better thank black people because the American with Disabilities Act was passed as a result of a provision of the 64 Civil Rights Act. If you are Korean or Chinese and you get to vote in your native language, thank black people because that's the 1965 Voting Rights Act. When you look at now housing, you can live anywhere you want to. Thank black people, because that was a 1968 Civil Rights Act known as known as uh, the, the Housing mm-hmm. Act. If you were gay and lesbian, thank and, and you gay marriage. Guess what? That's the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. One of the three Reconstruction Amendments, which was designed after the Civil War to also benefit African Americans. And so, what Candace is by, by saying is now questioning women pilots. Well, let's not question all women. Well, what are you saying, Candace? Oh, you're the exception, but not everybody else. This is all about these fragile white men who can't handle the fact they now got to compete, Stephen. They got to compete. They, not, you and I, we, we know how we were raised. We were told you got you to be twice as better. To the get half as much. Have, to get half as go. much. And the problem they have now is we are rolling up saying, no, 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 no. No, no. We want fairness. Yes, we want equity. We want inclusion. We want a seat at the table. And they and many of them have been riding high for centuries, decades, making money, doing well. And but all of a sudden they freaking out, brother. But Roland, I get, I get what you're saying, but we've seen plenty of corporations dilute, if not flat out eradicate their DEI programs. Based on what you're saying, we were moving yes. in a forward direction, but all of a sudden, and, and, and press, especially in the aftermath of the George yeah, Floyd murder, absolutely. but since that time, it's diluted to some degree. They've been eradicating he, DEI programs, DEI why. personnel. What's up and with that? Why. And here's why. Okay. This right here, W.B. W. Du Bois' book, Black Reconstruction in America. This right here is Eric Foner's book, 
Reconstruction of America's Unfinished Business. In the history of America, black success has always been followed by white backlash. Reconstruction, 10 to 12 years, 1865. You all of a sudden go to the 1876 election, contest it. The Great Compromise of 1877, now put into place Jim Crow, which lasted 92 years. Mm. Then all of a sudden, you go forward to the second Reconstruction, which is the Black Freedom Movement. That lasted 13 years, beginning on December 1st, 1955, going through King's assassination. What then happened? It's in the data. Oh, uh, 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 okay, look, look, uh, look, look, y'all can go to restaurants now. Y'all can go to hotels now. Y'all can vote now. Can we be done with this stuff? And so, George Floyd, I was telling everybody, folks, this third reconstruction needs to last a minimum of 20 years, and you got to address the money. Because in the first one, the money wasn't addressed. That was 40 acres in a mule. In the second one, money wasn't addressed. If you look at the last five years of King's life, he was focused on the money. Coretta Scott King said they killed my Martin when he started talking about the money. That's right. Now, all of a sudden, the George Floyd piece, corporations announced. 40, 50, 60 billion dollars in commitments. Many of them have not done it. But you get the white backlash. It's like it's Trump is right there, all, all of the MAGA folks. And so hold up, what's going on? You know, that they've gotten enough. Mm -hmm. And so now they're pulling back because of that white fear. And well, I don't want to take this side but out. You gotta have corporate leaders who have the guts to say, we cannot have a future mm -hmm. if we are not appealing to all of America, mm -hmm. and not just white America. I'm talking to not only uh, uh, an outstanding host, Roland Martin Unfiltered, more than 1.2 million subscribers, by the way. Major props to you for that. But I'm talking to a friend, somebody that I respect, that I know is far more knowledgeable on these subjects than I am. You brought up how they're fearful of this backlash. Perhaps that explains the following that Trump has. But in the same breath, what I would ask you is this. Shouldn't the fear reside with folks, whether they be on the left, whether they be on minority communities, et cetera, when we look at the momentum being gained by the former president who's got four counts against him, I'm sorry, four indictments against him, right. 91 counts, he could absolutely positively end up being a convicted felon of and still being in the White House, which says something to me about the state of this country. So when you talk right. about the fear they may have, what about the fear we should have? Well, here's the deal. Remember, he won following eight years of Obama. He was the white backlash to eight years of Obama. In my book, White Fear, I start, I've, I've been fixated on this since 2009 because there was a study, that uh, there was a, a poll that was taken, Stephen. And the question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Every group, Black, Latino, Asian American, Native American, majority said yes. Only one group was less than a majority, white America. September 2016, the question was asked, another poll, another survey. Are you optimistic about the future of America economically for the next 10 years? Black people, lowest wealth, highest optimism. Latinos, second lowest wealth, highest optimism. Guess who has the highest wealth in America? White people. Guess who had the lowest optimism? white America. So now you got to go behind that and say, wait, hold up. How y'all got the highest wealth, but you got the least optimism? It is because the winds are shifting. They don't control everything. And so what Trump does, Trump comes in, says what he wants. He's able to pull the covers back. And so, oh, y'all can say what y'all want too. There used to be a penalty for uh, dancing with neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Oh, now they're welcome. Remember, Trump had lunch with one of them at Mar-a-Lago. You've got white nationalists who are members of Congress right now who speak at white nationalist conferences. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no longer a penalty on the Republican side. But this issue we're talking about, Stephen A., is not left-right. Because you got some white liberals who got a problem with black advancement. Mm -hmm. you got some white liberals who got a problem with DEI for the very same reason. And so when you step back, and this is what a Candace Owens won't do, this is what a, uh, a Charlie Kirk won't do, you step back and go, wait a minute, 90% of the people who are leading ad agencies where they represent 340 billion annually are white. 
You look at the corporate, the CEOs in America. You look at the people, hell, is sitting in Congress. This notion that, oh, my God, they're just taking over. We get one, two jobs. They start freaking out. And so what we have to understand now is you are not going to have an America where one group has all the power and the money and the rest of us don't. You know what that's also called? South Africa in the wake of apartheid. Yeah. And so the battle that we're dealing with right now is we need intestinal fortitude from political leaders, from corporate leaders. And we also need all of those people, the millions of people, the millions of black people and white people, and Latinos and Asian, Native Americans who were out there protesting in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. Mm -hmm. We got to let them know, baby, that just wasn't getting no started. It's not months. finished. That wasn't no one, two month thing. Yeah. You got to be in this fight for the long well, haul. So that's, that's you got to understand the battle. Right. See, they were just they were just showing up for the moment. Right. No, moment and movement are two different things. This is a battle that we are in the middle of right now, and it is not going away. White Fear, that is the title of your book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. We will definitely get into a lot of this as the months, as the weeks and the months progress, Roland Martin. Obviously, I'm going to have you back on. I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show, man. Thank you so much, my brother. I keep appreciate doing, it. Thanks keep a lot. doing what you're doing. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. The one and only Roland Martin right here with Stephen A. on the Stephen A. Smith Show, courtesy of YouTube. Up next, I got to get into a couple of additional things. Snoop Dogg would beat one of them, supporting the former president of the United States. Nicki Minaj and Meg Thee Stallion getting into their own little beef as well. Plus, I got a boxing segment coming up because I got some things on my mind in regards to Canelo Alvarez, Terrence Crawford, Jamal Charlo, and an abundance of boxing news that I want to touch on with my man, the one and only Dan Rayfield. So stick around. You're listening and watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over YouTube. Back with more in a minute. What, what, what's that? What are you putting a box uh, on my desk for? Just open it. Just open it. You couldn't have opened it for me? What? <laughs> yeah. Ah, my new book on paperback. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. It works for me. It works for me. Y'all see this? New forward and all. Stephen A. in paperback, straight shooter, memoir, second chances, and first takes. I haven't gotten over that picture. It does look pretty smooth. I must say so myself. It's a bestseller. I'll hold on to this. Hope you go out and get it. Thank you all so much for the love and support. Wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here with the digital airwaves of YouTube. Listen, there are very few things that piss me off, contrary to what you would normally believe. I don't get pissed off at much because most things don't matter that much. But I love the sport of boxing. And I got to tell you, I'm so disgusted. They're just rumors, but we understand that there are things that get attached to rumors, some level of legitimacy and substance. When I heard the rumors that Canelo Alvarez, Saul Canelo Alvarez, is talking about fighting the bigger Charlo this time, this time around, Jamal Charlo, the natural 168-pounder, okay? I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, this guy's had a fight once in the last two and a half to three years. He obviously had some personal issues. Why pick him? And then you're hearing that after that fight, oh, I'm going to fight. Terrence Crawford, who, by the way, started out his career lightweight, junior welterweight, went up from 140 to 147, is now the welterweight champion of the world at 147. That's 21 pounds lighter. That's three weight divisions lighter than Canelo Alvarez. I'm like, 
What about David Benavidez, the natural super middleweight, who's 28 and 0 with 24 knockouts, who's been begging for Canelo to get into the ring with him? It really, really ticks me off. But rather than get on my own soliloquy or my own diatribe going off about everything, I decided to bring in the experts, okay? Because I wanted to talk to a colleague of mine, formerly at ESPN, where he worked with me at ESPN for 15 years, okay, before departing in 2020, all right? This guy right here, a boxing analyst extraordinaire, a boxing writer extraordinaire, the one and only Dan Rayfield. What's going on, big time? How are you, man? How's everything? Hey, Stephen A. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the intro. First of all, let's get right to it. When you heard the news that this is a potential fight, this is a likely fight coming down the pike with Canelo versus the bigger Charlo, Jamal Charlo, your thoughts? Well, I was not surprised, but I'd be honest, I was a bit disappointed. And by the way, this is not something that just has come up in recent days. If you go back to the period of time pr just prior to the signing of the fight between Canelo and Jermel Charlo, who is his younger brother, twin brother, who was at that time the undisputed junior middleweight champion of the world at 154 pounds, who was going to move up two weight classes if he, when he fought Canelo. Originally, it was supposed to be Canelo against the big Charlo, who's the one of the champions at 160 pounds. So the fight between Canelo and Jamal was already in play prior to when he fought the brother. But the brother, the 160 pounder, was not able to get to the fight because he was having his own issues outside the ring. He was dealing with some mental health problems and those sorts of things. And so therefore, it was sort of like they did the switcheroo. Instead of going with the, the 160 pound Charlo, they went with the 154 pound Charlo. That is who Canelo fought in the last fight lost basically every single round. And now here you have Canelo preparing for uh, what will be a fight on May 4th, the Cinco de Mayo holiday, and they did an opponent. And so apparently uh, the the bigger Charlo, Jamal, who would also be moving up a weight class instead of two weight classes like his, right. his brother did, uh, he's back in the mix. Now, as I have described it, those are the rumors. But the fight is not signed. It is not done. It has not been publicly announced. As I have described it, he is the leader in the clubhouse in a, in a group of fighters that would be probably a lot more appealing. When is Canelo going to get criticized for all of this? I'm not trying to imply that nobody has thrown any criticism his way, Dan. But here's my problem with this. You fought Bavall, you lost. You've got two draws on your resume along with two losses. So as Teddy Atlas, the great Teddy Atlas once said, recently said, by the way, he could easily be deemed as being 60 and 4. I'm not even sweating that. My issue, Dan, is... You're four to do two weight classes lower than you in a smaller Charlo, Jamel Charlo. Now you're talking about Jamal Charlo, who would also have to move up, correcting me from earlier, because I talked about him being at 168, when in fact he's at 160. I'm just saying, David Benavidez is at 168, the reigning, um, this dude is 28 and 0 with 24 knockouts. How has Canelo gotten away with avoiding him this damn long? Well, as far as the, the, the who he's going to fight and not being criticized, I think some people, they do. And I'm, in, I'm among this group, I admit this, that you give Canelo a little bit of slack because in the end he has fought all of the guys, maybe not at the exact moment that you or me would like to see them take place, but he has gone through and fought the top fighters. And I also will give me a lot of credit for having the stones to go up to 175 pounds to fight Bivol, who was an undefeated fighter, who was a great technical boxer, who was at worst the number two guy in that weight class who's about to fight in June for the undisputed But title not a knockout Michael artist. Yeah. But not a knockout artist. I get your point and would completely side with you, Dan, if you were talking about Better Biev. But Better Biev is the monster in the light heavyweight division. He's undefeated. He's the knockout artist. He's the one that pummels opponents. It's not like Canelo fought him, but I understand you avoiding him because you're not a natural light heavyweight. So why fight a natural light heavyweight who will punish you to death? So you're fighting Bavall, that's fine to move up to fight a technical fighter that isn't necessarily a knockout artist, even though you ultimately lost to him by decision. But at the super middleweight division, you've got David Benavidez there. This is a weight that Canelo has maturated too naturally, I might add. And I'm just saying, fighting smaller guys really is the problem for me when you're a power puncher and a mauler the way that Canelo Alvarez is known to be. Yeah, I, listen, I can't disagree with that, but I, I just say... Because of what he's done, he does get a little bit of slack, and he is the champion. He did go through that weight class, and he won all the belts. And I think at this point, he's gotten – he fought the Bivol fight, as you mentioned. He's come back since then, and he has won. And now people are going to get a little bit antsy, a little frustrated, because they do want to see him 
against some of the top guys in his own weight class. So while it's okay if you talk, talk about, I wouldn't even give him problems if he fought Crawford, because at least you and I know that boxing is a business that will generate enormous amounts of interest right. in the mainstream and money. So I don't even have a problem with that. It's when you fight, if it happens, and let's keep it real, that it's not done yet. So I don't want to say sure. it's 100%. If he does go forward and fight against uh, Jamal Charlo in the May fight, it is because it's uh, a move that maybe it's because uh, Al Heyman and the folks at PBC had promised Charlo the fight before he made it uh, an, an inability to get to the ring and they gave it to the brother. But the biggest problem is it would be done over a group of other more deserving guys to challenge for the title. Benavides clearly at the top of the list. I have shouted from the rooftops in uh, in my writings and in my in my Fight Freaks Unite Substack newsletter that this guy, if you say that Canelo is the undisputed champ, which he is with all the belts, then David Benavides, without question, is the undisputed mandatory, the undisputed people's number one contender, the guy who is by far and away the most deserving of the opportunity. And if you if you stipulate to the fact that, well, he's not going to fight him yet, maybe he'll fight him in September, so they're going to need another opponent for the May fight, well, fine. Then you go and take a look at Jaime Munguia, for example, who is now still undefeated after a big win the other night, where now he's 43-0. and and a fellow Mexican, which would make a lot of sense on the Cinco de Mayo uh, holiday. There are other fighters in the weight class. David Morell, an undefeated uh, title holder. Big top who, fighter. Technically speaking, is his mandatory challenger in the WBA. There's other good quality opponents for him to fight at 168 pounds. Terrence Crawford, you brought up that name and you said you wouldn't have a problem with it, neither would I to some degree because it makes sense from a box office perspective. What I would have a problem with is this is a guy that just fought at 147. And you're talking about him fighting at, 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 against a 168-pound champion. Now, if he was willing to move up and Canelo was at least willing to move down to a catch weight of, say, 160 to 158, I'm all for that. But we know that's not what Canelo's talking about. So why, would she, why should we support him against a guy in Terrence Crawford who is superb, arguably the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter on the planet, but also an individual that walks around fighting 21 pounds and three weight divisions lighter? The Canelo no, Alvarez. But, listen, I understand that. And just, just to be clear, it's Canelo is not the one that's been out there shouting about wanting to fight Terrence Crawford. As a matter of fact, if you look at any of his public statements that he has made to any number of media outlets, uh, he has never said that he was interested in fighting Crawford. That's come more from other people and speculation. And, of course, the fact that Crawford is now aligned also with PBC. And it seems as though the rematch with Errol Spence is not going to take place for a variety of reasons, including the fact that Errol is on the sidelines after having recent cataract surgery. So Crawford's in need of an opponent. But it's not been Canelo or anybody on his team that is out there saying, I want Crawford. So I think that's more of a, of a, of a social media and a, and a rumor sort of situation. Uh, I'm just making the point that if he did offer that from a commercial point of view, I get it because it's boxing. But in the spot for May... You have a plethora of available and quality guys who are legit, active 168 pounders who are in Charlotte, who, by the way, even in his last fight, when he came back after the two plus year layoff, right. he fought a welterweight in Jose Benavides. That's David's older brother. Right. And he won that fight and he, he he failed to make the weight for that fight. They contracted it at 164. He came in at 166. He won the fight fine, but he didn't look exactly uh, terrific in that fight. So he, and again, I have, I'm not knocking Charlo or his brother. I've got no beef with either one of those guys, but from an athletic point of view, he's not done one darn thing to earn a shot at the super middleweight champion of the world. Having said all of that, what are we to make of Benavidez being avoided in the future? We look at it now and we're like, okay, fine. It's tolerable, but it's getting intolerable to be quite honest with you. How many more fights are we going to sit idly by and let Canelo have with others that are not named David Benavidez before there's a collective uproar, not just the Dan Rayfields and Stephen A. Smiths of the world going off about it? Well, that's a good question because Canelo, when he signed with PBC, it was for three fights. The first fight took place in his last bout. That was the uh, Jermel Charlo fight. The second fight will be the fight that comes up in May. Theoretically, that might be the Jermel Charlo fight. Then right. you're looking at fight number three of that three-fight contract which would be the final fight in September, which, as we mentioned, might be a Terrence Crawford. Hopefully it's David Benavides. One thing I have learned, Stephen A., is that in boxing, when you do contracts, the biggest fight usually happens in the last fight of the deal. And the, this, the uh, David Benavides fight, by far and away, is the biggest fight that they can make in terms of competition 
in his own weight class, Crawford notwithstanding, well, in terms of being a smaller guy. Hopefully it's the September fight, because we know it's not the May fight. Will Al Heyman and BBC make PBC be able to make the Benavides fight if Benavides, if it was Benavides and Canelo? Because I don't recall whether or not Benavides is under the umbrella. Yes, he is with, with PBC. Okay. And he and his team, Samson Lukowitz, they want that fight. They say it all the time. I have zero, zero, zero question in my mind whatsoever. They could make that fight in five seconds if offered. Uh, they know the market rate. They're not going to look to blow it up because they're going to scrap for every single penny or dime on the table. They'll make that fight if offered in two seconds. And keep in mind, by the way, David Benavides is the WBC's interim champion. Yes. And at some point, they will make him the mandatory. So if the WBC wants to at least help make the fight, it's not a guarantee because Canelo is going to do what Canelo wants to do. But they can help at least put it in play and force it to some degree mm -hmm. by making that the mandatory and ordering the negotiation and put some pressure on Canelo to do that. But they have not really shown an, ad an aptitude or a desire or a willingness or an appetite to do that. I'm talking to one of the greatest boxing writers in America and you. So I, it's, it's, it's apropos that I transition from Canelo to asking you this question about Terrence Crawford. I don't want to see Errol Spence Jr. in the ring with him again. He got destroyed. And I, I, I thought it was the kind of ass whipping where you just don't need to have him in the ring. I, first of all, I thought he needed a full year off, so it looks like that's going to happen. And I'm very happy about that because he certainly didn't need to get back in the ring in December or even this summer. He needs to stay away from Crawford as far as I'm concerned. I'd love to see Jamel Charlo versus Terrence Crawford. That's the fight that I think that Terrence Crawford and everybody should want to see Terrence Crawford have. Do you have somebody on your wish list? whether it's Charlo or somebody else, that you think would be ideal for the great Terrence Crawford? Well, I agree with you about that. I'd be perfectly fine and happy to see him fight Jermell Charlo, who is the lineal and has still one of the belts in the junior middleweight division. He's sidelined for the moment. He's got some legal issues and some problems. So it doesn't appear, though, that would be the immediate offing. So if it's not going to be Jermell Charlo, the biggest and the best fight to me as a fight fan and somebody that could also create some interest outside of the United States is a fight against... Tim Zhu, who is the WBO's junior middleweight champion. He was the long mandatory for Charlo, who had a pull out of their fight, which was scheduled for last January in Vegas. He got uh, Charlo, suffered an injury uh, um, and had a call off the fight. And before it could be rescheduled, he obviously got the much bigger financial opportunity to fight Canelo. So that fight never happened. And so when he got in the ring to fight Canelo, the WBO stripped him of the title. They knew this was happening. And Tim Zhu was elevated from the interim champion. Now he's the reigning champion. He's got a defense coming up. It will be the first uh, main event on the PBC's new deal with uh, Amazon Prime Video. He's fighting a non-title fight against Keith Thurman, who's been out of the ring for a while and wasn't ranked. But that's a, a matchup with the name. But if Tim Zhu goes through Keith Thurman like a lot of people think he'll do in his first really big American fight, that's going to create a lot of interest. And certainly Tim Zhu is going to be considered the number one fighter in the division in terms of what he's been doing lately because Charlo hasn't fought in a while in that weight class. That would be a very outstanding matchup between him against uh, Crawford. And if you don't know the name, Tim Zhu was the son of the great former undisputed welterweight champ, Costa Zhu, who's now... Uh, in the Hall of Fame and one of the greats of all time in well, that weight class. Well, we know Casa Zua. We know Zab Judah remembers him very, very well. Let me <laughs> say this to you. Let me say this to you right now. No disrespect to Zab Judah, but that was funny when he got dropped by <laughs> Zuda, even though Zab Judah was great. And I got a lot of love for Zab Judah. Having said all of that, I don't know if Zoo can mess with Terrence Crawford. I've watched him fight. He's got a lot of power. Um, he can take a punch. That's, there's no question about that. But in terms of boxing skills, I don't know if he's the dude that can deal with Terrence Crawford. What fighter out there, just regardless of whether it's welterweight, junior middleweight, what fighter out there do you believe has the best chance against Terrence Crawford based on what you've seen from Crawford and the fighter you'll name? Well, listen, I have Crawford ranked number one pound for pound on my list, and so there's a reason for that. He's a superb athlete. He's a superb technician. He's very intelligent in the ring. He is vastly experienced. He comes in shape. He's got power. He's got speed. He can fight right-handed. He can fight left-handed. He really literally has no uh, negatives in his game, usually even the greats. You know, you talk about the five-tool players in, in baseball or the guys that can do it all, you know, in a basketball court. There's some element of their game that may not be as great as all the others. I literally don't see a single weakness in Crawford. He takes a pretty good shot. Uh, so there's not a lot of guys I can even think of that would, in my opinion, be able to hang with him. Once he dispatched and did so quite easily against Errol Spence, there's nobody in the welterweight division at all, even close, that you would even make a fight. So to find somebody 
that would be competitive with him, you have to sort of force him up the scale. Now, there's been uh, uh, Teofimo Lopez, for example, is, is the junior welterweight champ. He's been calling out Terrence Crawford. I and think it's that's not a mistake. It's not unusual scenario for the guy that's the junior uh, welterweight champ to fight the welterweight champ. And as, as outstanding as Teofimo is, and he's got a fight coming up next week, I don't know if anybody would really give him a shot. So there's nobody from the lower weight classes that you can see hanging with, with Crawford. Mm-hmm. I said there's nobody to hang with him in the division that he's in, which is welterweight. So you got to go to the junior middleweight division. And I think the best guy in the division that could give him some problems probably would be Zoo or a Charlo if Charlo is right and got his his stuff together. Last question, going down further within the boxing divisions in terms of weight. Javante Davis is Javante Davis. We know what a study is. Uh, he dispatched of Ryan Garcia. We get that. We understand it, even though we believe in Ryan Garcia, who's now moved up to 140. The ideal fight for Javante Davis would be who? Would it be a rematch against Ryan Garcia? Would it be going up against Teofimo Lopez? Who would it be? Would it be Devin Haney entertaining that kind of fight? Last question. Who do you believe would be the best, most ideal, most attractive fight for Javante Davis and the public? Well, it's certainly not a rematch with Davis. I mean, between Davis and Garcia, Garcia would probably have to earn that. And I could see it maybe right. down the road. But in terms of next, you have to look at the two, the other best guys at 100, uh, you know, in his weight class. He's 135 pounder, but his best opponents are really at 140. And he has fought in that weight class, too. So I would say for my money, I'd like to see him fight either Tiafimo Lopez or Devin Haney. Take your pick. I don't care. Got you. Dan Rayford, before I let you get on out of here, you brought up Substack. I want you to tell everybody where to find you, you, your work, and what you've been doing. I appreciate that. Yeah, Substack, uh, the newsletter uh, platform. I write my Fight Freaks Unite. I'm the uh, publisher of the one-man band over there. I've been doing it for the past uh, three years or so since I left ESPN. It's been a, a, a great experience. Fight Freaks Unite, danrayfield.substack.com. Please come join the party. Punch in your email and get the missed. As I say, Stephen A., punch in your email. You don't have to go search for the boxing news. It comes to you. I appreciate you as always, man. It's good seeing you. It's been a long time, man. Really, really good talking to you. You take it easy, okay? Thank you, Stephen A. All right, buddy. On to other matters. My boy Snoop Dogg recently made waves when he commented on former President Donald Trump by saying he has, quote, nothing but love for the former president. Snoop told the Sunday Times, Donald Trump, question mark, he ain't done nothing wrong to me. He has only done great things for me. He parted Michael Harris. I have nothing but love and respect for Donald Trump. Keep in mind, before I'll go into my position on this, that the one and only Snoop Dogg himself had previously been vocal in his disapproval of Trump's presidency. Because in 2020, on Real 92.3's Big Boy's Neighborhood, he said, quote, I ain't never voted a day in my life, but this year I think I'm going to get out and vote. I can't stand to see this punk in office one more year. So the change comes because Donald Trump basically pardoned his boy, Michael Harris. Fair enough. Let me say a couple of things. Number one, everybody knows Snoop Dogg is my brother. I love him to death. I do not like to hear anybody black talking about how they never voted. One of the greatest conduits of change in this nation, and one would say arguably throughout any democratic society, to affect change, one of the greatest components is making sure that you vote. If you don't vote, you don't have a right to make noise about certain things. I understand it can be a disconcerting. I understand how your vote can seem meaningless at times because you vote for somebody and you see stuff getting manipulated, you see politicians acting up, you see people being as dishonest as they can possibly be and whatever they can do to get away with it because they want to cater to a constituency. You see all of these things, but in the end, that's just giving up in the fight, whatever your fight may be. In a democratic society, you vote. So I'm never going to co-sign on that. Having said all of that, I'm not going to condemn my boy Snoop Dogg either for his position on Donald Trump because he explained why that is. We may not like it, but when people do things that affect us directly and personally, usually it'll sway us to some degree. In this nation, when you talk about politics, in this nation, when you talk about affecting change and what have you, we're usually, we're usually monolithic in our thinking. Our one issue is what matters to us. If you're pro-choice or you're pro-life, 
that usually influences the direction in which you will vote. If you focus on the economy, that's your thing. If immigration reform is your thing, if worrying about the borders is your thing, that's what you usually vote on. We are like that in America. So in the case of Snoop Dogg, that's his boy, Michael Harris, and Trump getting his boy out of prison, who was in jail for over 20 years, for attempted murder of a police officer, if I remember correctly, that matters to Snoop in a completely different way. You want to hear somebody support Donald Trump? Listen to Dana White of the UFC. What does he say all the time? Trump was there for me at the beginning. When nobody wanted to touch the UFC, he embraced us. He let us use his facilities, his properties to promote our events. When big things happened for me, he was one of the first to congratulate me. I'm quoting Dana White from the past, who, by the way, I spoke to today about those very things he said about Trump to see if he indeed had changed his mind. He said, oh, no, I'm very, very consistent. I support him because I've known him personally for decades, and I know what kind of man he is. I don't like some of the things he says sometimes or anything like that. I wish he would do certain things differently. That is true. But the man that Donald Trump is... Dana White says he's going to support them. You have people that are married to their specific issues. In this case, Snoop Dogg is one of those people. And I can't knock him. He felt the way that he felt about Trump years ago, but Trump let his boy out, and he changed his mind. Would that be me? No. But Snoop, Dana White, and various others have the right to feel the way they want to and to care about what they want to care about. That's the way it goes. Let me transition to another subject. And that would be in the world of music. Obviously, Snoop Dogg is in that, but we ain't talking about him right now. We're going towards Nicki Minaj and the one and only Megan The Stallion. In the world of music over the weekend, two of the biggest female hip-hop stars, I just told you who they are, reignited their years-long beef. And to say it has gotten very, very personal would be an understatement. The two have been trading diss tracks about each other and started last Friday when Megan released Hiss, which some believed was a diss against Minaj and her husband, Kenneth Petty. You can see right there, I ain't even reading this stuff. I'm not even reading these lyrics. I'm not even reading them, okay? But just look at what they are. You see it for yourself. It's right here. It's right here for you. Take your time, read it right there. I'm not reading this stuff. I'm going to say this to you. It prompted Minaj to diss Megan on Instagram Live and X, formerly known as Twitter, with a new song of her own called Bigfoot. Let me say this. I don't mean to sound like Rodney King, but can we all just get along? Can, can we all just get along? Ladies, Megan Thee Stallion, you're a phenomenal lyricist. Everybody knows that about you, right? From Texas, Houston, Texas, you've been doing big things with your career. We understand that. We get that. Nicki Minaj, I want to remind you of something, because you are the elder statesman in this. You're the person that's been around longer. You're the person that's about 13, 14 years older than she is. You're the person that's been in this game a long time. And according to you, Nicki Minaj, you said in your past how you were raised in a home, your father was a drug addict and ultimately was very violent and once burnt down a house in an attempt to kill your mother, according to reports. And you said that prompted you to be somebody that was about female empowerment, empowering women, looking out for your sisters down the line. Mistakes happen, things get misconstrued, Things that are wrong or inappropriate get said from time to time. But in the end, when that's what you're about and that's what you stand on, I'm not saying you're wrong. I don't know what happened. I don't understand all this. I don't pay attention to stuff like this normally. But I know that you two sisters are big time. And I'm talking to you directly, Nicki Minaj, because you're my Queens girl right here. I understand you were born in Trinidad, but you were raised in Queens since you were five years old, giving love to South Jamaica at every turn you can. You my home girl. Hollis Queens in the house. I'm just saying to you, be a little nice, let stuff roll off your shoulders. I understand better than most recently how we need to get something off our chest from time to time, just one time, but then after that you let it go. 
Megan the Stallion's doing big things, you're doing big things. Leave it at that. That's all I wanted to say about that. Now, I don't know if y'all caught it, but this weekend, specifically last Friday night, I made an appearance on the HBO show Real Time with Bill Maher. In case you missed it, check out your boy. You got to be able to play, and like with Bronny James, here's the interesting part about that. I think that kid can play. I think he's got potential. Is he there yet? No, but I think he's got the potential to be there. But LeBron James went front and center from day one and said, I want to play in the NBA with my son. Yeah. And because LeBron James is still elite, averaging nearly 25 a game at the age of 39 in his 21st season in professional, in professional basketball, 30. he's such a moneymaker that the thought of LeBron James coming to any franchise, even if it's just for a year, you're thinking about the financial windfall from all of that. And if LeBron comes there and all we got to do is get Bronny James, you never know who might decide to do that. But in the end, if Bronny James makes it to the NBA and he ultimately survives in the NBA, it will be because he can play, not because of his dad. So you're absolutely right. The Nepo babies that you're talking about, that doesn't happen in professional sports. The public won't let you get away with it. First things first, because there's a couple important nuggets to peel from that. Number one, that was a good-looking brother right there that was talking to Bill Maher. I don't know if y'all know or not, um, but that brother right there, dressed in all black, he was looking pretty smooth. I just wanted to throw that out there. Number two, I love the show, love Bill Maher. One of my favorite segments in the world of television is New Rules. Major props to him. Number three, when I think about what this country needs, I don't veer light, right or left, even though for the most part I vote Democratic, even though I did vote for a Republican for and Chris Christie for governor of New Jersey. The reality of the situation is, is that I think that both sides have leaned towards the extreme in very uncomfortable fashion. I don't like any of it. When I think centrist in this country, people who are centrist, whether they're leaning right or left, two names I come up with is Chris Cuomo and Bill Maher. I think about that all the time. Now, obviously, both of them are on television. Chris Cuomo is hosting his show over at News Nation. And obviously, Bill Maher is in year 22 on HBO's Real Time, doing a phenomenal, outstanding job, and I love doing that show. It got me to thinking, and it's a question that I asked y'all. I'm a fan of Bill Maher. I'm a fan of The Daily Show. I loved it when Jon Stewart was there. I loved it when Trevor Noah was there. I like John Oliver on HBO as well. Could I, Stephen A. Smith, do a show like that? Oh, no. I'll leave that answer to y'all for the time being. Just want to throw that out there. Let me get to the tweets before I get on out of here. I'm going to get to the callers as well because I'm back in my home studios so I can take those live callers. Right now, let me go to some of these tweets up here. Here's somebody at Carcino Muse, right? Stephen A. Smith. Who do you think is the best athlete in SpongeBob? And if you were to draft a character as your starting quarterback, who would you pick? Ladies and gentlemen, I haven't seen much of SpongeBob. Damn it. But I'm going to entertain y'all by guessing. Let me just look. Give me a second to just look, all right? Let me just look at it and, and, and engage who looks the most athletic and, and who would I like. Now, SpongeBob with the big square head, I got to consider that because I always wish I had a big square head so I could go bald instead of having this damn receding hairline and contemplating going to hair club for men. So I figured, you know, hey, I wish I had a big square head. I wouldn't have that debate, but that's neither here nor there. I'm not interested in plankton. I don't like the way it looks. Mr. Krabs, I just don't like that name. But if I'm playing football or basketball, those, 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 those claws could come in handy. So I got to take that in consideration. Patrick, I'm not feeling with you. you. You look like a pink skinhead. I'm not going with that. Let me look at Sandy. Nah, with the cup is your body. No. Squidward, too skinny. Gary, you look limited. Pearl, big face schnoz out in front. Karen, you just a TV with a, with, with, with a leg. I'm not, and Larry, eh, eh. I'm going to have to say it comes down to Mr. Krabs or SpongeBob. And I'm going to go with Mr. Krabs. That's what I'm going to do. 
SpongeBob's legs are too skinny, the head looks like it weighs too much, and the arms are too short. I don't think it would be that athletic. I'm gonna go with Mr. Krabs. That's gonna be my choice for that, all right? Next up, give it me next tweet, please. At more 33 gaming rights, you pick the starters. Now pick the final forms. This is Pokemon right here, by the way. I'm gonna say to you, you know what, I kinda like Charizard. Um, the fire on the tail, the wings, he can fly, the claws on his feet, he could use that as a weapon. He's not as limited as Blastoise or Venusaur. I'm gonna go with Charizard. I'm gonna go with that. Next up, give it to me. At C underscore Raleigh 5 writes, who will finish with more rings, Mahomes or Curry? That's an interesting question. I would tell you Mahomes. If I didn't, if you told me that Curry was gonna stay in San Fran and go to state, and obviously Mahomes would remain in Kansas City. I think it's a possibility that somewhere down the line, Steph Curry could ask out of Golden State if things continue to falter and go someplace else where they'll win. That's my personal opinion. If Curry stays in San Francisco, it's clearly Mahomes, the answer to this question. I just don't know how long Curry will be in San Francisco. I can't imagine San Francisco, uh, the Golden State Warriors ever trading Steph Curry. But if he demands it and wants it two, three years down the line at the tail end of his career, I could see them giving him what he wants because they would owe it to him with all he's done for the organization. Don't know if it'll come to that, though. Let me get another one right here. Actually, I'm sorry. This calls because that was my last tweet. Didn't realize that. But let's get to the calls right here. 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. That is the number to call into the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Let's go to Chase in Arizona. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Chase? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Steven, this has always been a dream of mine talking to you. First time caller, long, long time listener. Well, thank you I so got much. a two part question for you. Okay. Number one, out of the top five, you know, the five big sports baseball, basketball, football, soccer, hockey what do you think is the most physically demanding? And then, second question, would you ever be interested in being the host of the Bassmaster Classic? Thank you so much, Stephen A. We love you. Uh, appreciate the call, Chase. Thank you so much. Uh, the answer to that second question is no, I would not be interested in hosting the Bassmaster Classic. I'm sorry. I have too much stuff to do with my time, and it would, that would not be one of them, although I respect those who participate. Wish you nothing but the best. To answer your first question, I would tell you the most physically demanding sport would be football. Soccer, with your legs, you got to run all day long. You got to be in phenomenal condition. That is true. Boxing, you, of course, you have to be in condition, but you got to worry uh, uh, about somebody punching you in the face or the body or whatever. You don't really have to worry about their legs. Football is an incredibly, incredibly violent sport. They can hit you low. They can hit you high. They got helmets and pads on. It doesn't seem to be that protective. You can get hit solidly, but your, your head hits the grass and you get concussed for crying out loud. Um, it's, like, it's like a car accident happening every play in the National Football League and even in college football to a lesser degree. So I would have to tell you that the direct answer to that question would be football. Let's go to the next call. Appreciate the call again, Chase. Thank you so much. Let's go to Aaron in L.A. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Aaron? How are you? Hey, Stephen A. It's Aaron from Los Angeles. All I'm right, keenly interested in seeking your insightful analysis regarding the imminent Super Bowl. Specifically, I want to hear about your perspective on the more pivotal matchup that is likely to shape the outcome of the game. Would you consider the clash between the Chiefs' offensive prowess and the 49ers' formidable defense as the defining factor? Or do you believe that the Chiefs' defensive strategy against the 49ers' offense holds greater significance? Furthermore, in the hypothetical scenario where you assume the rule of the 49ers' defensive coordinator... Hold it, hold it, hold it. What the hell is this, science class? Let's take one step at a time. I mean, my God, I understand what you're saying, but 90% of the world don't even understand where the hell you're coming from. Let's take the first question into consideration <laughs> first before I give you a chance to answer the second question. The answer to your first question is this. There's no more formidable defense in San Francisco, not what I've been seeing over the last few weeks, nor is there a formidable offense in the Kansas City Chiefs because as great as Patrick Mahomes has been, his wide receivers has led the league with 44 drops coming into the AFC Championship game. So I'm 
I'm not sold on that. That's number one. I think it's more going to be about Kansas City's defense and what San Francisco's offense is going to be able to do against them. Now, what's your second question? In the case that you were the San Francisco 49ers defensive coordinator, would you set the tone and just double Travis Kelsey right from the jump? Absolutely. He's your primary weapon if you're Travis Kelsey. I would dare the rookie, Rice, along with Marquez Valdez-Scantlin and others who clearly have dropped balls. You got a guy like Kadarius Toney swaying up and down. He wasn't injured, even though they put him on the injured list and what have you. And he's arguing, you know, letting the world know that, that, that they're getting holes and just telling all of, this, all of the team's business. But I would certainly say that I would put the wide receivers in a hot seat. I would want to see whether or not they could beat you. I know Valdez Scantlin just caught a key third down pass and secured a win against Baltimore in the AFC Championship game, but I dare them to do it again. Travis Kelsey's money. He's a future Hall of Famer. He's arguably the best tight end in the history of football. He's a two-time champion who's proven he's very reliable. I need to see the others and what they're going to do in a pressurized bowl that is the Super Bowl, see what they come up with, what they could deal with before I sit up there and not, and not double up on Travis Kelsey. I'm sorry. I would have to. I appreciate the call, man. Thank you so much. Let's go to Jordan in Boston. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Jordan? How are you? I'm doing great, Stephen. I hope you're doing great as well. I'm all right. Uh, I got two questions for you. Uh, first one's going to be sports-related. Uh, huge Celtics fan, and I love uh, what they've done so far this season. Okay. However, uh, past couple of games, we've gotten uh, some injury scares from Christoph Porzingis. Obviously, we knew that was going to be a thing going into this whole deal with him. However, do you think that the Celtics are still in a prime position to make it all the way to the finals, potentially win it? Um, with or without Chris Stops, or do you think that they need to do something here at the trade deadline to bolster that well, uh, roster, especially with the depth they have in the center? With let, let, first, yeah. first of all, let me tell y'all this. Y'all questions are too damn long. We're going to have to shorten these questions okay. up in the future. It's too damn long. All yeah. right, I know y'all want y'all yeah. own show. Go get it. It's not hard to get a YouTube show. Go ahead and get it if y'all going to ask them long-ass questions. Let's get that out of the way. Right, Number right. two, let me say this to you. When I look at the Boston Celtics, I think they're the best team in the East. I think that Jason Tatum is a superstar in this league. I think that Jalen Brown is a star. He's getting paid $305 million for a reason. Chris Stapps for Zingas at 7'3", who can shoot and block shots, is a plus. I wonder about their girth on their front line. They've got height and size at every position. Jason Tatum is 6'9". Mm -hmm. Jalen Brown 6'7". Right. Derek White's about 6'5". Right. Drew Holiday is the same. They got size. Their depth is a question mark off their bench, even though they got cats like Pritchard and others that I think can make a contribution. I think they need some girth, but they could still do it. I would say to you, in my perfect world, I need them to two, two, do two things. I think they need to get some help on their front line in terms of girth. I would like to see them go out there and get a Dwight Howard, a DeMarcus Cousins, or somebody. Somebody mm. to throw in there to give you 10 to 15 minutes of beef per game. I'd like to see that. That's number one. Number two, they can't be jacking up 43 threes a game. <laughs> right. One game they shot 60. They can't do that. Mm. You can't live and die with the three like Boston does. That is what I think mm. my concern is. I don't think that beats the Denver Nuggets. I don't think so. Mm. And that's assuming Denver comes out of the West because just today on national television, linear television, I proclaim the Los Angeles Clippers to me, I find to be a legitimate threat. Of course, that really depends on the Kawhi Leonard and, and, and Paul George being healthy and James Harden showing up when you called upon to show up. Can't say enough about the job that Russell Wilson and Norman Powell have done coming off the bench. And Russell, Russell Westbrook, I'm sorry, has been a leader on mm -hmm. that squad. I got to give love where love is due. But that's my answer to your right. question, sports-related. What else do you have? Well, the follow-up question is you kind of hit on it. Um, I'm very interested in doing sports journalism slash broadcasting, something similar to what you do. Do you have any tips for someone my age, uh, 22, trying to get into that? Okay, first of all, you're 22 years of age. You just said that, correct? Correct, So sir. you're a puppy. Are you still in school or did you graduate? I'm actually uh, active duty in the Marine Corps. Oh, so you're active duty in the Marine Corps. So you are a serviceman. First of all, thank you for your service, okay? Let me say this thank to you. You. Mm. you have to research. You have to have mm. an idea of what you want to say. You have to have information to back it up. Substance, substance, substance. You can give whatever opinions you want, but you have to first show the audience that you have an idea what the hell you're talking about. So when you give an opinion based off of that substantive information, they can respect where you're coming from because you took that into consideration before you disseminated a message to them that you want them to grab a hold of and believe. 
That's the first mm. order of business. So one of the things that you want to do is you want to write. You want to sit up there and you want to tape yourself on video. You want to get a camera. You want to tape yourself. You want to listen. You want to listen to content. You want to make sure you have that information. You want to try to cultivate resources that you can reach out to to buffer and, sub and subsidize your content to some degree. All of those things come into consideration. There's a whole bunch of people. It's podcast everywhere. There's a whole bunch of people with podcasts. There's a whole bunch of people pontificating and expressing their opinions, but they ain't really doing no damn work. And the audience sees that for what it's worth. And one of the things that I want you to be careful about getting caught up in, if you decide to do your own YouTube show, if you decide to do a show in the digital stratosphere, a whole bunch of people, and this is what I find disgusting about people in this business, is when you make noise talking mm -hmm. about other people in the business instead of actually mm -hmm. doing the work. Now, every now mm -hmm. and then, you got to check people. Everybody knows I've done that. But the flip right. side to it is that I have a 30-year career where I've already proven that I have journalistic integrity, that I'm going to go out there and do my research and do my homework and cultivate resources and contacts, et cetera. I'm going to interview folks. I'm going to have contributors to the show. I'm going to do all of those things. Why? Because it's important towards credibility. And that's what you want. You got people out here that want to make noise. They want to make money on YouTube. I had somebody at the in-season tournament in Vegas literally say to me with my back turned when I wouldn't turn around and acknowledge them, come on, Stephen A., as he was trying to heckle me and I ignored him. Come on, Stephen A., come on, Stephen A., we trying to make money too. So he ain't about being substantive. He's not about being accurate. He's not about being professional. He's about doing anything it takes to create clicks so he can get paid. That's what a lot right. of these cats are doing. There's no longevity in that. You will right. be squashed forever, eventually. And when that happens, they'll have you on tape to show why you were rendered to being insignificant. Don't you get caught mm. up in that. And remember, you're 22 years of age. You're a puppy in all of this. You got your whole life ahead of you. Don't rush it. Take your time. Do what you need to do and position yourself for the, better, for the best opportunity chance favors the prepared mind. Never forget that. I got to run, brother. I appreciate the call. Let's go to Cameron in St. Louis. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Cameron? How are you? Hey, what's going on, Stephen A? I'm good. How about yourself, man? I'm good, man. Talk to me. Man, I got a two-part question for you. Go ahead. One, will you, will you be attending WrestleMania this year in Philly? In I don't know Florida? yet. I, I don't know yet. I mean, WrestleMania is in Philly. It's right up the road, but I got obligations with this job, with ESPN and others, you know, where I got to be out of town. So I don't know if I'll be around, but if I'm around, I've already received the invite to go to WrestleMania. And if I'm around and I have the time, I will be there. Man, I was hoping you was going to host this year, man. No, I, well, you uh, know, we're not ruling it out. You know what I'm saying? We're not ruling it out. I mean, you, the, the folks at WWE may want me to be the modern-day Paul Heyman or Bobby the Brain Heenan. I mean, you never know. You just never know. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. You, the Rock already talked to me about joining him at WrestleMania. I mean, we don't know. We don't know if he's going to be there. We don't know if I'm going to be there. And even if I did know, I wouldn't tell you because they wouldn't want me to tell you. But you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my second part, man, since Cody won the, uh, won the Rumble on Saturday, man, who you got in the rematch between uh, Cody and Roman, part two? Uh, I'm going to go with Roman. Cody's no joke, but I I'm a Roman Reigns kind of dude. I'm going to go with Roman. Uh, I'm going to go Roman. I'm going to go Roman. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to do that, bro. You acknowledge the trouble, too. Here we huh? go. Appreciate you, bro. Thanks you so much. Fernando in Pawtucket. All right. I believe that's it, Pawtucket. What's going on? Fernando, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Stephen A., I appreciate you. Love what you do. My quick question to you, and I have a little two-piece, is should the Chiefs really be in the Super Bowl? Are they Super Bowl contending teams? Like, obviously, they're in the Super Bowl. They only average 21.8 points a game, 11-6, worst record since 2017. What's your thoughts on them? What are you asking me? I didn't hear your do question. You think, do you think they should be in the Super Bowl right now? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Respectfully, for, Fernando, how old are you? 21. You know, you, you know when I use the words breath smelling like Similac wet behind the ears? You know where that comes from? When you're do young not. and you just don't know better? You know yeah. good and damn well, or you should, that if you win, you deserve to be there. They went to Baltimore and they beat the number one seed. The week prior, they went to Buffalo and beat Josh Allen. Okay? The week prior yeah. to that, freezing in Arrowhead Stadium, they smoked Tyreek Hill to a tongue of a lower and the Miami Dolphins. 
Hell yeah, they deserve to be there. They beat the best in front of them. Do you think Just they'll wait. beat the 49ers? I think so. I think they should be the favorites. Because I th uh, Patrick Mahomes, he's just that dude. And, and I've seen holes in San Francisco's defense. They don't, they don't break completely, but they give a little bit too much. You don't want to do that against Kansas City because that defense is real. Baltimore was the number one defense. Kansas City was number two, led by Chris Jones and the crew. They've got speed. They've got athleticism. they got some hitters on that squad. Steve Bagnola is one of the elite defensive coordinators in the game. And then offensively, you got Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. With Pacheco, who is no joke as well. So that's the way it goes, and that's what I got to tell you about that. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for the call. Appreciate all of y'all calling in, and thank y'all for joining the show uh, this go-round. I really, really appreciate it. This is Stephen A. Smith signing off. Until next time, everybody, peace and love.